Hello and welcome to Criminal Justice in a Nutshell. My name is John Fisher and today's episode is going to be psychological reasons for crime. Granted, this is going to be a 15 or 20 minute lecture, so it's going to be hard to cover everything. Uh, but in a nutshell, we're just going to talk about some of the psychological reasons why people commit crime. And when we have discussions about mental disorders, uh, it always revolves around guns and access to guns. Just think for a second. Let me give you a few names. Uh, Jared Lee Loeffner, Adam Lanza, James Holmes, even Omar Mateen. Okay. Do these names ring any bells to you? Omar Mateen should, because uh, just a couple weeks ago, he went to the Pulse nightclub, which is a gay bar. It's supposedly a safe place for homosexuals and the LGBTQ community. And he went and he killed 49 people. He wounded 40, uh, 53 others. Uh, and he himself was killed. So it gave us a grand total of 50 people dead. Uh, Omar uh, Adam Lanza is responsible for Sandy Hook. And he went into Newtown, Connecticut, went to the Sandy Hook Elementary School. He killed 27, I think 24, 25 of them were elementary school children. Uh, Jared Lee Loeffner uh, is the man who's responsible for shooting and killing Gabby Giffords. Uh, not, he didn't kill Gabby Giffords. He shot Gabby, G Gabby Giffords. He killed six others with a nine millimeter handgun. Okay. James Holmes dressed up like Bane, went to a Batman premiere in Aurora, Colorado, and he killed 15, 16 people um, there. These trials are still going on, but we automatically hear about bipolar disorder and mental disorders and mental disease and manic depression or, and, or manic depression and all of these other things that evolve to or relate to criminal activity um, because there was something wrong with their brain. And I want to go back in history, way, way, way back in history to before Caesar Beccaria. And if you know, weren't if you remember Caesar Beccaria from an earlier and from classical criminology, Caesar Beccaria is the first of the criminal justice theorists. And but prior to Caesar Beccaria, we believed that anybody that committed crime, anybody that did anything that was uh, wrong we found or we determined we associated them with um, demon possession or they're in league with the devil or they're witches or, or something to that effect. Well, the positivist movement came about in the um, 1800s. And one of the theories, one of the ideas of the positivist movement was a psychological disorder, a mental disorder that causes us to commit crime. You know, it's just a scientific way of saying, hey, they're demon possessed, man. Um, forensic and criminal psychology is the fastest growing field within the world of criminal justice today. Everyone wants to know why people do the things that they do. Okay, and we see this all the time throughout history, throughout the world, um, that when somebody, um, when somebody messes up, somebody commits a crime, they go on a mass shooting, they, they do all of these things, we want to figure out why they did what they did. Why are serial killers the way that they are? Why do people do the things that they do? So forensics and criminal psychology are is one of the fastest growing subfields of the psychology world. Okay, so there are two major issues or major ideas that come from early psychological theories. And these two ideas is behavioralism and personality. So with behavioralism, it's a known behavioral theory. Its emphasis is on behavioral conditioning. I don't know if you remember the the Pavlov's dogs and the reward and punishment for particular 
ideas of particular behaviors. With Pavlov, he would ring this bell, ding, 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 and the dogs would start coming and they, because they knew that they were going to be fed. So every time they heard the bell ring, they started to salivate because they knew that they were about to eat. Okay. Well, you could do the same thing with people. You reward them for good work. Okay. And we, we used to see this um, with the YMCA sports, you know, or with high school sports, where they're the champions. They work the hardest. They won the most games. They become the champions. And if you want this same reward, you need to work harder. Okay? Just like you guys in my class, uh, you guys are going to take a test. You know, those of you that have put in the time, you've put in the study, you put in the effort, you're going to be rewarded with an A. Those of you that didn't, you're going to be punished or sanctioned with an F. And then you're going to fail my class, and then you're going to have to go take it over again. So that was behavioralism. The other is personality. And personality is, or the personality disturbances, is a process of moral development and, a, and or a disease of the mind. And so where we move into the personality is we look into the personality disorders. There's a disease of the mind. You're a sociopath. You're a psychopath. And that's a big question. What is a sociopath? What is a psychopath? And we'll order both. We'll, we'll address both of those um, here uh, momentarily. But psychopathy or being psychopathic is a personality disorder that's characterized by an antisocial behavior. Uh, you have a lack of sympathy or empathy. You have a lack of embarrassment. You know, it's the effective, well, let's back up a minute. You don't feel, you don't, you're not concerned with other people's feelings. You have no way to know how they're feeling because you lack empathy and you lack embarrassment. And I'm going to tread into really touchy waters here. But I just finished watching a video clip of the Gay Pride Parade um, in San Francisco. And there were a lot of guys and a lot of women running around naked. And they weren't even embarrassed about it. Kind of nudity and public nudity is something that you should be embarrassed about. You know, they didn't seem to be embarrassed. I'm not saying that all homosexuals are sociopaths or, or psychopaths. But that's just the example that I'm using. If you find somebody that does something or says something that should be embarrassing and they're not getting embarrassed, uh, they're most likely a psychopath. Um, a psychopath is effective at manipulating other people and other people's motivations. Okay, I can get you to do something that you don't really want to do, by playing on your emotions, by, by toying with um, your feelings. Because I know what your feelings, I know how you feel, and I can manipulate those feelings. I can get you to believe the same way that I believe, or something to that effect. A sociopath, well, the psychopathic personalities was fully developed by uh, Hervey M. Cleckley in his book called The Mask of Sanity. If you have not read The Mask of Sanity, you really do need to. It's, uh, it's a fun book, it's an important book, and it tells you all about the psychopathic personality. A sociopath, on the other hand, is born normal. Okay? They, they see a, a psychopathic person, um, a psychopath, is born this way. They're born without a sympathy. They're born without empathy. They're born without emotion, and they're, they, 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 they can't be embarrassed. Okay. A sociopath is born normal, and they have all of these emotions. They have all, all of the ability to be sympathetic, but something happens in their life. There's a trauma in their life that affects them and changes the way that they view the world, um, and then they pick up and they adhere these psychopathic characteristics. Okay, so cognitive theories is another issue on how to develop or how to change the behavioral personality. Okay, so cognitive theories or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is a way to develop morality. Okay, the moral developmental theory, individuals become criminal 
when they have not successfully been or intellectually developed. Okay, so if they have not been successfully completed their intellectual development, they are less likely to have a moral standing. Okay, there's a book that's running around that says, I learned everything I needed to learn in kindergarten. And, but that's not exactly true. Well, in that book, you, you learn how to share, you learn how to feel about others, you learn how to think about others. You know that there's more in this world than just you and your desires. But there's a lot of people that are running around that don't come to this level of enlightenment. And this theory, a moral development theory, was created by uh, Jean Piaget, Piaget. Uh, another one of those French names, and I don't speak French, so you might have another pronunciation. Here in Texas, it would be Jean Piget. <laughs> P-I-A-G-E-T. Piaget. Um, and he said that he believed that development went through a series of stages. In fact, there were four stages that he that he said that every individual goes through before they reach perfect enlightenment. And you go through these stages based upon your education, based upon your level of education. As you become more educated, you become more moral. You have a greater understanding of what's going on in the world, and you will respond um, to your environment. Piaget said that people responded to their environment, and they acted in a way to their environment. Okay. As a PhD candidate, uh, I have more education. I'll probably I have been trained to respond to my environment in a different way. Somebody that does not have as much education as I do may respond in a different way. Okay. But according to Piaget, uh, I could go up and down the spectrum. You know, to right now I'm giving you an intellectual lecture at. Um, nutshell lecture on the psychological reasons for crime uh, and here in a little bit I'm going to go in and play with my eight-year-old at his level however Jacob could never come to my level right now at his stage of development once he increases his stage of development um, then things will you know he will increase in his in his development uh, Puget's work was expanded by Lawrence Kohlberg um, on the levels of maturity. And our levels of maturity are extremely important within the behavioral therapy. We need to be able to figure out how we can get to perfect enlightenment. I'm not saying that I am. I can guarantee you I am not. There are times in this world, especially with Facebook, where I just go off the deep end and I just start screaming and hollering and yelling at people. I have a very short, low tolerance uh, for ignorance, and my ignorance comes out. So I have not yet reached um, that cognitive um, place of enlightenment. The next theory in behavioral theory is cognitive inform informative processing theory. And this theory involves uh, human perception. And this is what my dissertation was on, was on perception. And uh, people will create, they will evaluate, and they'll make their decisions uh, by engaging in a series of complex thought processes. Okay? And if you have a proper education level and you've been properly developed by your parents, by your teachers, by your education, you're going to go through this thought process and you're going to, um, you're, you're going to find yourself creating your perception. But this is added to, and, and I know it's supposed to be 15 minutes, but we'll probably go to 20, 25. Um, but cognitive, this, the cognitive information, informative processing theory has been manipulated. I'm going to use manipulated by Cass Sunstein and others who state that I can adjust your perception based upon the choice architecture. If I keep feeding you information and I keep feeding you this particular information, you are going to evolve and you're going to create your impressions or your perceptions based upon that. There's a great quote out of the movie, uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Yes, I'm a big John Wayne fan. Uh, but in the end of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the newspaper editor tears up and he crinkles up and he throws away the interview. And Jimmy Stewart goes, wah, 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 why'd you do that? And the editor goes, 
when the legend becomes truth, you print the truth. Okay, when you, excuse me, when the legend becomes the truth, you print the legend. You ignore the truth. You ignore what's going on because this is what is believed to be true. Everybody's perception has come across and said this is the way that it is. So that's how they process it and that's the information that they give you. You create your behavior. You create your ideas based upon the information that has been given to you. Okay, script theory was developed by Robert Shank and uh, Roger Shank and Robert Abelson. And they explain the understanding process that occurs during any situation or event. Okay. A script is a predetermined stereotypical sequence of actions um, that define the situation. What would you do in this event? What would you do in this case? What would you do because of this or this or this? Um, we, we've already pre-structured all of our actions. You know, what are you going to do if you get terminated from your job? You've already got your habit down. Okay, I'm going to go file for unemployment. I'm going to go um, look for another job. I'm going to go fishing more often. I'm going to do whatever I need to do um, in order to, to, to push um, the script that's already been established. Now on the personality defect side, briefly, I want to talk about Sigmund Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud brought up and he developed psychoanalytical perceptive. And he developed and he brought to us what is known as the id, ego, and superego. And these three things within our brain is what helps us make our decisions. It helps us decide what we're going to do. And if our ego or our superego is deficient in any way, then we're going to find ourselves um, acting upon our id. So let me define these real quick. First, the id. The id is our drives, our wishes, our urges, our lusts, uh, those things that we want to do. Okay, my next door neighbor is eating a hamburger. I'm going to go, you know, my desire is to go over there and take his hamburger away from him. And this is what my id says. It's our primal emotions. It's our primal desires. And we go chasing after those primal desires if our ego is not intact. Okay, so our ego is uh, not to be confused with the current definition of ego. Because you hear people go, well, well, what an ego you have. Or that's so egotistical. You know, I just say, thank you. I have a well-working ego. Because our ego is based upon reality it tests reality you know what would happen if i went over there and took that hamburger from my neighbor my neighbor would probably punch me in the face okay or something it would cause a problem um so our ego controls our lusts it controls our desires it controls the id because without the ego without an ego our id will take over and our ego will uh, not our ego, but our id will take over and we will operate on our primal Neanderthal instincts of beating the woman upside the head, dragging her into our cave, raping her, and sending her on our way. Without the ego, all of us are rapists, serial killers, and thieves. Without the ego, our primal desires take charge. So when somebody tells you, well, you're so egotistical. Well, just thank them. Say, thank you. Because my ego is what's keeping me from beating the shit out of you. Ooh, that was a bad word. Sorry. Please forgive me. My ego is what's preventing me from beating you to death. Okay. So, what's my super ego? My super ego is our, my moral guide. How Whatever my moral guide is. Um, being a Torah observant believer, uh, Messianic Jew, Karaite, Nazarite Jew, whatever you want to call me, I have a certain set of beliefs and standards. Um, and that belief and standards is my superego. It properly developed, if it's properly developed, it evaluates the ego's plans, dismissing those plans that go against your morality and while accepting those plans that conform with your morality, okay? So your superego is, is your guide. It's your conscience. It's that thing that says, you know, 
that's unethical. That's immoral. I can't do that because of this. Okay, your ego will turn around and, you know, it will try to meet your id desires, but it will um, provide legal alternatives to ob object that, to obtain that. Instead of saying, hey, you know, go beat the woman upside the head, grab her by her ponytail, drag her into the cave, have your way with her, kick her out, and rape her, essentially. Your ego is going to say, you know what? In this world, what we do is we take them to dinner, we take them to a movie, we get to know them, we talk to them. Um, first date, we might hold hands. Second date, we might kiss. Third date comes the sex. Ooh, yeah, way. Well, the super ego will say, yes, that's fine, but that does not meet your moral ethical code. That doesn't fit the guide that you have established. You know, the super ego might say, I can't have sex until marriage because my ethical desire, my ethical code says so. Okay, so this has been a nutshell lecture of the psychological causations for um, crime. And I guess I need to summarize the Freud. If your super ego and your ego have not been properly created, properly developed, you will turn to crime and you will commit criminality. Okay, so this is John Fisher, criminal justice in a nutshell, psychological reasons for criminality. I hope you have a very good day.